Hello, my name is Sean, and over the last year I've had a little bit of a growing interest in woodworking. And so in this video I'm going to show you how I made this box for uh, my granddad's birthday. Every Christmas, every time his birthday rolls around, every Father's Day, it's like, what do we get for this man? He has everything. He has 400 ties. So I decided to make this for him because I knew he'd appreciate the effort that went into it. He worked as a coach builder for almost 35 years, you know, making the frames and the bodywork for, for trucks and vans and that kind of thing. And growing up, there was all kinds of furniture in the house that he made for us. There were stools and side tables. And when I was about eight, he made me a desk. And I have a really fond memory of drawing on it one morning before school while Doug played on the TV. The stuff he made was so precise. And as a kid, I kind of just took that as a given. Like, yeah, that's what furniture looks like. But I've come to understand just how difficult that is. So I'm like retroactively so impressed by it. So a few weeks ago, I went over to my parents' house during a heat wave. I started making this box out in the garden in 27 degree heat. It was really intense. Poor Henry had to lie on the tiles beside his bed to try and cool down. The wood that I used was a pre-planed pine board from a hardware shop. Planing or milling is basically the process of smoothing out the wood and making sure that it's perfectly flat and straight and square, meaning that the edges and the corners are 90 degrees. Last year I bought some wood for the first time and it was like so twisted beyond what I thought was possible. Like it, it almost came back on itself. I don't have a way to fix that myself right now. So I thought it would be okay to buy wood that was pre-planed and it wasn't. <laughs> and I'll get to that in a little bit. The first thing I needed to do was figure out how big the box was going to be. The material I had was three quarters of an inch thick because I couldn't get anything thinner and I didn't have a lot of time to make it before his birthday. So I had to just go with what I had access to. I didn't want it to be too big, but the smaller I made it with that three quarter inch material, the chunkier it was going to look. It took me a full 20 minutes to work that out and I settled somewhere in the middle. Not full chunk, but not super elegant either. Since I made this box, I've started using a 3D modeling program for the iPad called Shaper 3D. It's really cool. I'm just using the free version at the moment, but I've modeled the box to show you what it will look like. And I can refer back to this whenever I need to explain something. But at the time, I just kind of had a rough idea in my head. I didn't plan it too much. Before I started cutting down the side pieces, I put some painter's tape along the lines that I intended to cut because I've heard that can help with tear out, which is basically when you cut a piece of wood and the end kind of splinters because it's not supported properly and uh, the cut isn't super clean. These cuts did come out really clean, however, but the saw was brand new, so it could have been down to that. Next, I took those side pieces to my table saw and I cut them down to their final lengths. I needed two longer pieces for the front and the back of the box and two shorter pieces for the sides. If you're new to all of this, uh, the thing I'm using here is called a cross cut sled. Mine is very rough, but basically what it is, is a jig that you can make, which helps to support the wood better when you're making cuts across the grain like I'm doing here. My sled was the first thing I made last year, so I probably need to make a better one soon. So I decided to attach these side pieces together using rabbit joints, which are basically when you take a groove out of the end of one piece so that another piece can sit into it. So I use my router to cut these rabbit joints and just real quick, so no one's getting left behind. Basically a router is a tool with a bit in it that spins really fast and it's able to carve away huge channels of wood really quickly and it makes a massive amount of sawdust. I didn't have a lot of experience with it at all really, before I made this and I made loads of mistakes and learned a lot about using it. So that was cool. I needed the rabbits to be wide enough so that the other board could sit into them, but I didn't have a bit wide enough. So I had to do multiple passes with a smaller router bit to work up to the width that I needed. And I also needed them to be about half the width of the material deep. Um, but I didn't know how much I was able to shave away in one go. And I was afraid of kind of doing too much and pushing it. And I thought, you know, that could damage the wood or the router bit or me. <laughs> so I needed to cut rabbits along both ends of the front and the back pieces. And then I needed to cut one along the bottom side of all four of the side pieces so that the base of the box could slot in. So I set the depth of the router bit really shallow and I made way more passes than I needed to, adjusting it really gradually each time until I built up to the depth that I needed. In this case, all of these side pieces came from one larger board and they were stacked side by side because I had to arrange it that way to make sure that there was enough wood left over for the base and the lid of the box. If they were end to end on a longer board, what I could have done was cut the rabbit along the bottom all in one go and then cut them to their final lengths. And that would have ensured that all the rabbits were the very same width or depth, both, and it would have sped up the process. You know, I do think it's interesting how the process can change 
based on the order that you do things or just the material that you have to hand. One of the things that I love most about my day job in animation is the problem solving aspect of it. And woodworking is 90% problem solving and I'm really enjoying learning the basics because uh, I feel like these problems aren't like anything I've had to think about before and it's kind of making me think about things in a, in a different way. It's cool. Like I came up with a solution for a problem that I was having and it, it felt really cool to work it out. So I'm trying to cut these rabbits and I have the workpiece held down with two clamps, meaning that I have to do every pass in two parts. So I would start the first half of the rabbit and then the router would run into the clamp and I would have to move it back out of the way and then finish off the second half of the rabbit. And it just took so long. Here's a pretty good shot that illustrates what I'm talking. Oh no, never mind. I tried using just one clamp in the corner, but the force of me pushing against it was causing the piece to, to move and to pivot. And that's no good. So eventually I clamped a piece of plywood down right next to it so that when I pushed against it, it had nowhere to go. And it was kind of a cool and quick solution, uh, just using stuff that I had on hand. And that, that felt cool. At one point after I'd made a pass with the router, I noticed that the groove wasn't straight. And that happened because I wasn't careful enough when I clamped it down. The workpiece overlapped the table slightly instead of hanging clean over the edge. And so halfway through routing, the guide that was attached to the router stopped following along the edge of the workpiece and came in contact with the edge of the table and just started to go off in that direction. And I'm talking about these little awkward mistakes because I was really figuring it out as I was doing it. And I think it's kind of cool to see the progression, do you know what I mean? Like, I won't make that mistake again. I'm gonna be thinking about that in future. After many shallow passes and a lot of fiddling with clamps, I got the rabbits down to the depth that I thought they needed to be. I did a test fit and they were too deep. I'm gonna build a router table soon because I don't have enough experience using it handheld and it's really hard. So the side pieces were a bit too long and it was all looking pretty rough. And then I realized there was a bow in the wood and I didn't check for that because I wrongly assumed that if you buy a piece of wood that has been planed for you, it's going to be accurate. But obviously that's not the case. And at this point, I realized that this thing wasn't going to be perfect. And I did want it to be because it was a gift. And I definitely have a kind of perfectionist streak in me and I'm trying to iron that out. And I, I, I tried to, you know, adjust my expectations and I started to just hope like, okay, I just want this to be okay. <laughs> I took some of the roughness away by sanding and I trimmed a little bit off each side and got them to fit just fine. Next, it was time to cut the base piece. So I clamped the sides together and roughly measured how big I'd need it to be. I cut it oversized deliberately with the intention of nibbling it down to the right size with the table saw. So there was a lot of back and forth of checking the fit and then going back to the saw and shaving off a little bit more and then checking the fit again. And I just repeated that until it fit perfectly. Except it didn't fit perfectly, did it? It went in, but I realized there was uh, some pretty significant gaps. And when I flipped the base over, it was tight on one end and quite loose on the other. And I think a combination of things led to this box not quite being square. And that meant that the base didn't fit perfectly either. And I don't think I had enough wood left over to make a new base. So <laughs> kind of just had to go with what we had. Like I said, I just sort of took it as a given that because it was planed, it was going to be square. And my, I guess my cuts were bad too. I didn't know that that's something you kind of had to continuously check as you worked on something or sort of just forgot. Maybe I did know, but I just forgot. When I tried to clean up the side pieces with sanding, I used a pretty rough grit sandpaper and I knew what I was doing, but uh, I didn't think it would have such disastrous effects. I obviously just removed way too much wood and left it with a pretty weird shape and some pretty big gaps that could not be closed up no matter how hard I squeezed. But look, at this point, like, what can you do? Do you know, I was going for uh, finished, not perfect. I finished the day by gluing the base of the box together. And then I stuck a heap of clamps onto it in the hopes that each one would pull it together somehow. And the next time I'd come back to a perfectly square box. And would you believe that's not really how it works? That's all I managed to get done that weekend. And so I came back the next week to finish it off. The glue had dried I took the clamps off and I gave it a bit of a sanding. I'd shown a picture of the box to my friend and she said, look, but a wood filler would be grand. And that actually reminded me of something that I'd seen about making your own wood filler. So I decided to give it a go. And I remember watching a video where the guy started by saying, uh, hey folks, we got a real interesting one for you today. We're gonna be making a few different types of wood filler. And I remember my reaction was like, ooh, that is interesting. Like, woodworking has changed me as a person, you know? The idea with making your own wood filler is that you can take some wood glue and mix it up with some sawdust that has come from that project and you'll have filler that is an exact match, the same color as the wood that you're using. 
obviously didn't work. Uh, I think because I'm using Type Bond 2 glue and that's a bit yellow to begin with and the mix kind of came out like a dark brown. And for some reason, um, I still put it on. Like I didn't let that stop me. I, I put liberal amounts on the box to try and fill in those cracks uh, and I let it to dry for a little bit. And then I came back a while later and I tried to sand off the excess, but I couldn't quite get all of it. And so th there's there was some pretty bad staining on the underside of the box. I decided to use linseed oil for the finish because it's quick drying and like I said didn't have a lot of time to do this project but also I genuinely really do like the matte finish that I've seen from oils as opposed to the kind of shiny almost plasticky look that you can get from varnish so I applied a coat of the linseed oil and I let it soak into the wood for about 10 minutes and then I came back and wiped away the excess. I really love how the linseed oil brought the grain out in the wood you know it just looks so much richer but because it's not dark, it didn't cover up the wood filler staining on the underside. And at that point, like, what could I do, do you know? <laughs> it just added to the rustic charm of the box, I guess. So I set that aside to dry for a couple of hours and I moved on to the lid. I wanted there to be about a quarter of an inch overhang around each side of the box. So I measured out how big I wanted that to be and then cut the lid down to size on the table saw. And then I marked how wide I wanted my rabbits to be, in theory, it should have been an inch in from all sides to account for that quarter of an inch overhang and the three quarter inch material. The rabbits on the lid were pretty rough and then I made the very same mistake that I made with the side pieces. I sanded it to clean it up, took way too much wood away from every side of it and was left with a pretty funky shaped profile. The thing about doing as many passes as I was doing with the router is I'm not good at it and each one is another opportunity to make like a new set of mistakes and then there's kind of a knock-on effect trying to clean those up you know. I applied a coat of linseed oil to the lid and by this point the base was dry enough to apply the second coat. I totally forgot to uh, give it a light sanding in between coats but it actually came out really smooth so you know that worked out. <laughs> the one thing on the box that worked out. For, for some reason I thought I could control the flow of the oil out of the bottle so it went everywhere. Oh, no. It's dumb. It's funny, like as a beginner, at least for me anyway, and this is what I'm blaming that little oil incident on, is like, I keep seeing myself in the footage do really awkward, weird things and like little mistakes, because I guess I don't have the muscle memory and the dexterity yet. You know what I mean? I think there's something in that. Like you just pick stuff up weird and or put things down in weird places that end up being in the way, because you're kind of just like, you don't have that awareness yet. I think that's what it is. I think that's why I made the mistake. Later on, I put another coat onto the lid, and then the only thing left to do back home was stick on a little plaque that I got on Etsy. So the box came out pretty wobbly, but it looked like a box, do you know what I mean? I thought I measured the lid carefully, but it was a bit loose and it moved around from side to side, and the lid rocked around a lot on top, but uh, I mean, the wood was bowed, do you know what I mean? Even if I ended up sanding away like a quarter of the entire thing, it was bowed, so I'm, I'm not taking the blame for that. And I think my granddad liked it. I brought it over to him a few days later and, uh, and I gave it to him. And he was kind of like, whoa, you made this? And he didn't say much more about it to me, but then my, my mom and my aunt came in while I was there and um, I'm getting emotional thinking about it. He, he showed them what I made for him and it was cool. It was really cool. I learned a lot <laughs> from making this and I made so many mistakes. And I told him that the next one that I make for him will be better. <laughs> Even if it's only 10%, it will be better. I think learning by doing is pretty vital. And I think that in reflecting on the process to make this video, you know, I've learned even more than I would have if I just moved on to the next thing right away. You know, I'm watching the footage and I can recognize myself making the same mistakes and I didn't really realize it at the time. And I feel like maybe some of those lessons have sunk in a little bit more. Maybe next time I'll have like a bit more of an awareness about me, you know? Maybe not. I'm sure I'll probably make just a whole bunch of new and different mistakes. But uh, anyway, yeah, look, thanks for watching. It was fun to make. I hope you liked it. All right. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Hi. <laughs> Hi.